This episode contains mature language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. You wake to the sound of a train. The clack, clack, clack of wheels. In the distance, is that the sound of birds in a forest? No. It's angels in a choir. Or is it demons from hell? It doesn't matter. You have no memory of how you got here. All you know is that you are lost and that now you belong to the Grey Rooms. Hello again, roomies, and welcome to episode 14. Now, let me get a few things queued up here. All right, folks, it's time for Cadaver Sweep. Who's got the left middle finger? All right, you're on. Who has the large intestine? All right. You're on. And who's got a, uh, uh, let's see here, a spleen. (laughs) All right, you are on. (laughs) Yeah, I'm a nerd. Don't worry about it. Well, uh, join us as author Kyle Wilcox shows us A dangerous game. And we'd like to remind everyone that submissions for all Grey Rooms production podcasts are open. That includes Season 5 of The Grey Rooms, Bane, Ghost Signal, your own featured Grey Rooms miniseries, and a new upcoming Grey Rooms production we like to call Fireside Nightmares. So, if you have any terrifying tales you think might frighten us, send them on over so we can take a stab at it. There will be a link in the show notes with more information on the process, what we're looking for, and how to submit. The deadline for submission is April 17th. So tick tock, roomies, tick tock. And without further ado, please enjoy episode 14. I stepped back into hell, the heat and sulfur washing across my face. It was almost soothing now, comforting, strange as it might sound, a homecoming of sorts. 
At my side was another warlock of Astaroth, another John. He was too useful to leave to the whims of the universe, and so I had plucked him from another locus, a loyal soldier for my army. I left him in the care of Rasputin, Bran, the witch, Nolan, and the others. They'd get to know each other again, make themselves ready for what was to come. That was my hope, anyway. I'd done everything I could, prepared them every way I knew how. I stood with the shade of my son on a balcony, looking down on the sixth layer from Belial's tower. We were quiet as we considered the future, a future we'd forged together. Two Beckett's against the universe. It had always been that way, even when I was alive. My family had been just an afterthought in galactic politics. Well-connected, wealthy, certainly, but of no real merit. My grandfather had changed all of that. He'd set out a vision for the future, started a plot that would take three lifetimes to see completed. Now here we were again, the Beckett's against the universe. If we were going to survive, if we were going to thrive as servants of hell, it would be on our own merits. Our choices drove us, they defined us. Now we would see our choices made real. We would grasp the future in both hands. And if everything went to plan, we would once again sit atop a throne of our own making. not quite occurred to me until the second or third day of freedom from the runes just how much of myself I'd lost in my escape. I didn't care about the project. Not anymore. After everything that had happened, it was clear whatever relationships I'd had with the other members of management were ashes in the wind. But my few tangible belongings, the things I'd left behind. I found that I missed them quite terribly. My journals, cataloging my time with the project, my books of haiku, the few little knick-knacks and souvenirs I'd acquired during my time with Belial as my chain holder. It was all so mortal. I suppose. To grow attached to parchment and ink. To see your own vain scribblings as a testament to the passage of time. And yet, as I perused this tome lent to me by Miss Winters, I found myself profoundly saddened. With my belongings destroyed, as they no doubt had been, what was left to mark the centuries I'd been attendant to the Grey Rooms. The future was a mystery, which was a novelty I was growing to appreciate. But I'd long found that reflecting upon the past was a form of easy solace, and a way to give context to troubling events in the present. I had no idea what was to come, and without my past to guard my spirit and strengthen my resolve, I supposed I would have to rely on my friends. These mortal allies who had braved the Grey Rooms to free me from eternal torment. It was an uneasy feeling, knowing I owed so much and could offer so little. But then, if Samantha's power was change itself, if the goal of the Defiant was to reshape the realms, then I supposed I would have to acclimatize myself to a bit of uncertainty. Wouldn't I?
here we are, on the precipice of a brand new day, at the threshold of reimagining the very firmament of the cosmos. And I find that redefining the realms requires a frankly shocking amount of paperwork. We may be living in the most interesting of times, but the bureaucracy of the realms grinds ever onward. My quill scrawled endlessly across statements of intent, troop-mustering forms, and Byzantine inquiry letters. These parchments were to be forwarded to every duke of hell, every king and queen of the courts, every principality and heavenly choir. Then there were the endless questions arriving from Moth and Bez. The luminaries of the mount and the grove sought clarity on every decision we'd ever made. Why every guest was chosen why each iteration of the room was selected. It was exhausting, to be quite honest. I pinched my nose, massaged my temples. Terribly mortal gestures, I know. I would never have used them if anyone else had been present. But they were soothing, nonetheless. I noticed that my drink had cooled, and resisted, yet again, the urge to call for my attendant. Another disappointment. Another substandard employee that I'd need to see dealt with, eventually. In the meantime... I would roost atop the tower. As Beckett and the founder take the field, my battles will be with paper and ink and pleasantries. Our new faction, our new power, shall stand and be counted alongside the greatest of the old. I bent my head to yet another page and began a new missive, the same way I had done so many others before. We are called the Grey Rooms, and we will be hidden no longer. Since we got here, wherever here is, I've taken a rising with the dawn. Why there's a sunrise or docks or water or any of it is beyond me. I tried to ask Miss Winters a few times when she started nattering on about original sin and the true nature of Lucifer. <laughs> Best I got out of it is like, he only got as far as making a place where he could make mortals feel comfortable when he called it quits. Sort of like the grey rooms. Come to think of it. Hmm. Well, anyway, this is the nicest place I've lived in well, since I died, I suppose. Nobody here threatening to take out my eyes or staple my mouth or any of that. It's a good change of pace. The couple of weeks since we left the Grey Rooms have been some of the calmest, easiest, and <laughs> hey, I've got for all got friends, it seems like. <laughs> Bob's finally come round. Managed to get him to laugh a few times. Miss Winters is so intense. Hardly laughs or smiles, really. He's always been a good sort. Must have to get past all the destiny and drama to see it. 
As for old Todd, it's nice to be a part of something I can actually believe in. Feel like I'm contributing. Well, not just tidying up after the demons. Todd, drag that carcass over here. Todd, clean up that explosion of blood over there. I told Bob that I wanted to prove I ain't that guy. The me what blew up the domes. I think I done that. And more. Now I'm just happy to be... whoever I am. To sit and look out over the water. Help out with odd jobs. Handyman to the resistance, I suppose. The only thing is... I got a bad sort of feeling. Like when, like, like when there was a storm blowing in over the habitats. You feel it in the air all up and down your skin. I got that feeling now. Oh, I spent a long time, too long, being that psychopath's pet mortal. The warden ain't gonna give up looking for us. Nor the founder. Nor bleeding Nora the architect. Oh boy. But that's a problem for the Todd of tomorrow. Today, I just have to worry about what's for lunch. <laughs> Wonder if these angels and elves and things have ever had a good batch of chilli. <laughs> signaled down the bar, and Jeb made his way over. He poured me another drink, and I nodded in thanks for his trouble. Maggie's was quiet tonight. An unusual state of affairs, but then there was something in the air, wasn't there? All the good little winged boys and girls must be feeling the change as much as I was. The realms had been settled down for a long, long time. Too long. In theory, I served beings that were immortal. The queens and kings of the court had been around at the dawn of time. But on the job... I'd gotten to see entropy, death, up close and personal. And there are few constants in the universe, and one that, far as I could tell, was inescapable. Entropy gets paid its due, one way or another, every single time. I'd spent the day speaking with Penn and Beziel's mother. Charming woman. I'd walked away from that handshake with a host of warriors in my proverbial pocket, trained in spoiling for a fight. The Grey Rooms, as a faction of its own, was looking less and less like a pipe dream, and more like an all-too-real reality. I should have been happy. Should have downed my Viking juice with a grin. Walked out of this brothel with a skip in my step. But I wasn't. And I didn't. Something ain't sitting right. Something ain't sitting right about all of this. Too many coincidences. Too many unknowns. Maybe I'm just showing my age here, but... It feels like too much change all at once. That's the problem, I suppose. When you serve greater beings whose plans span the ages, you end up feeling like a cog in a machine, spinning and spinning and not sure you're really ever going anywhere. I'm sure I'll suss it out. 
I always do. It's what I'm good at, after all. So I'll just sit here at the bar. Maybe go upstairs and pay some nice boy or girl a visit. And in time, this will work itself out. After all, what else have we got? But plenty of time. The shot stings as it goes down. Warm. Tasting a bit of blood and a bit of bile. I make a face, but I'm glad I've got the bottle for company tonight. The liquor that our runaways bring to the sanctuary is... Well, it's weird. I've had the stuff the servants of the Mount consider whiskey. Honeyed booze from the grove. And of course... Who can forget Demon Jen? I still remember Jake. Poor old Jake. Standing behind the bar. Just trying to pour a lady a drink. Most days, I consider myself a lucky woman. I'm still alive. I have a purpose. And the universe has seen fit to give me a gift. A weird, sometimes annoying often repellent gift, but one that lets me punch my way above my weight class. So, it's nice. Still, I've seen and done things I desperately wish I hadn't. Forget the days of the bitch queen. Just like Todd, I want to believe I was a different person. Not even me. Not really. No. Just me, me. Samantha Winters. I've done things that I think would make even old Bob raise an eyebrow. All for survival. All just to be able to open my eyes at the start of a new day and say, I'm here. I still exist crazy how desperately all of us, mortal or no, cling to existence. It's one of the few things we all have in common. All of us, defiant. It's why I think, in the end, we're gonna win. Why no dukes of hell or angelic hosts are gonna get in the way of our simple, visceral response to their bullshit. We aren't machines. We aren't cogs in a machine or coins to be spent. We're people, damn it. Not pieces on a chessboard or coins in a vault. We deserve yeah. the right to exist. I could see it. Same on his as face. any of them high When I sat with him in the palace, it had Bucky been bucks. some time since I'd been down to the tenth lair. A few <sighs> centuries I at least. I just hope the price we have to pay is one. Lucifer more looked tired. The same exhaustion I feel in my blood and in my bones. Since the announcement of the project to the other dukes, to the courts, and the hosts, I've been asked one question over and over again. Why? Why come out of the shadows? Why hang out a banner as a new faction? Why upset the balance like this? Even if we are doing it, with the blessing of our collective masters. It's because 
everything ends. We built the factions eons ago in self-defense for a war that's long since over for an enemy that doesn't even exist anymore. I've gripped the range of power here in hell for countless mortal lifetimes, and now uh, it's time to make way for something new. I can't remember the last time I saw change on the horizon. That's why we're going to war. That's why my armies march. Why I'm going to smash my enemies on the other levels into shards of bone and meat. That's why we will hunt down Woe and his mortal friends and tear them asunder. I am Belial, Duke of the Sixth Layer of Hell, Lord of Heresy, and Master of the Walls of Dis. If my time is coming to an end, let it be such an end. And let the universe remember my passing long after I am gone. Tower 120 was the biggest and most modern residential building in the city. It was part of a district of megastructures that had been built to deal with the city's ever-growing population. Of course, some things would never change. The rich bought out the upper floors to isolate themselves, while the poor were left to fend for themselves in the lower social housing levels. The streets around the towers were busy. It was moving day. I wasn't paid to be here. My job required all employees to give 24 hours a month in volunteer service somewhere around the city. This weekend, my job arranged for all their workers to come to Tower 120 and move in new residents. Young families rushed past our group with their belongings in black trash bags. Guides quickly escorted them to the poor entrance, where they wouldn't be seen. The rich, famous, and influential were given champagne flutes in the lobby while a full staff whisked their belongings through the main loading bay. I noticed a cab and moving van pull up to the curb. I took a deep breath. So it begins. A small army of strong men began to unpack the wealthy person's belongings. 
They grabbed an oversized cream-colored sofa and other elegant pieces and made for the service elevator. The cab driver ran to the passenger side and opened the door. Can I help you, ma'am? Why, yes. Aren't you a sweet young man? Glad to help. I was thankful for this woman. Who knows what nasty things I'd be moving to the lower floors later. I grabbed a suitcase from the back of the van and escorted her through the front doors into the lobby. The woman leaned on me for support. She had a frail hand, but wrapped her arm around mine like a snake. Her grip was tight and unyielding. She refused the champagne in the lobby and walked at a brisk pace towards the golden elevator doors. Swiping her key card on a gray sensor pad, the doors slid open. A smooth ride brought us to her floor. She had to be well off to afford an apartment so high in the building. We exited the elevator onto plush carpeting. Only two doors were on this floor. One of them stood wide, revealing emptiness beyond. Hers was to the other side and closed. What luck. Only one neighbor. One of the perks of having worked and saved half your life is spreading out in your old age. You must have lived one heck of a life. I have, young man. And it is nice to see the young helping and having such respect for their elders. Your parents must have taught you well. We entered a sizable one-bedroom condo with stunning views of the city below. The windows stretched from wall to wall. I placed her suitcase on the floor. The rest of the movers followed behind us. It didn't take long for the space to fill with her belongings. I helped my wealthy acquaintance find a place to rest. And she sighed loudly as her body settled into soft, padded luxury. Oh. Be a dear and pass me that suitcase. I placed the case next to her, and she opened it to hand me a small tin. Here, take this. It will help keep your strength up. I opened it to find lemon slices inside. I thanked her for her gift and headed off to help with the rest of her things. Instead of the fancy elevator I'd ridden up, I'd have to take the service elevator back down, which didn't have the elaborate card system. I pressed the button for the ground. The floor beneath me shuddered as the doors closed. After a pause, it surprised me by going up. My confusion grew as the car gained speed. What the hell was going on? The sound of metal scraping on metal became deafening. I felt the room shift in odd directions. An elevator shouldn't move sideways. I arrived at what looked like a doctor's reception office. Sterile, bright, and silent. A middle-aged woman with a short black bob sat behind a desk, tapping on a keyboard. The woman glanced at me with annoyance. You're late. I looked around, confused. Late for what? Where the hell am I? The woman tutted and handed me a sheet of paper and a thick metal pen. No questions. Sign. I quickly signed my name on the dotted line, below a dense mass of text. 
forfeiture of rights and responsibilities pertaining to loss of life, limb, eyesight. What the hell? What is this? The woman snatched the papers out of my hand and handed me a blue jumpsuit. Go through there. Put that on. Is this some kind of uniform for moving day? Hello? Miss? I hope this counts towards my volunteer hours. She didn't look up as she pointed to a dark blue metal door to the left of her desk. It was obvious I wasn't getting any answers from her. I felt a pit grow in my stomach. There was something very wrong about this place. The changing room was empty, barren, and stunk of bleach. I changed into the jumpsuit and left my clothes in an unmarked locker. Following the signs through the changing room exit, I entered a space filled with people dressed in coveralls like mine, though in a variety of colors. Their eyes assessed me as my confusion ratcheted up another notch. I was about to ask someone what was going on when the lights went out. Welcome to the Tower Challenge. Do you have what it takes to get out of the tower alive? Well, we're about to find out today on Tower 120 Challenge. My breath caught in my throat. Surely I'd stepped off the elevator and into a dream. Yeah, there you go. That's absolutely. Thank you. I glanced around at the other panicked and bewildered faces. You will face a series of three challenges. The one person still alive at the end gets to leave. Isn't that fantastic? The group erupted into chaos. We'd all heard the rumors of the rich using the less fortunate for sport. Now it seemed, those rumors had turned into deadly facts. Quiet down. Quiet. We begin... now. A door in front of us opened and we spilled into a large gaming arcade. Hundreds of claw machines lit up in front of us. And at the end of the room, a single door. The crowd pushed and fought for the nearest machines. Small fights broke out. People shouted at the games and banged their fists on them, begging to be given the prize and their lives. Come on, one more time. Let's go. Come on. At the rear of the room, I came across an untouched machine. With no other choice, I began working the clawed hand, attempting to grab one of the hundreds of prize balls. I looked at them closely. They all seemed empty. A thousand plastic fish eyes watching me futilely fight my doom. But then, something caught my eye. Inside one ball, there was a faint outline of light reflecting off metal. I focused my efforts there. It was difficult for my shaking hands to place the claw accurately. Each time I pressed the button to drop it, I missed. Or the forks didn't grab the plastic egg firmly enough, letting it fall free. I heard a swell of the voices in the room. People were winning keys. With each success, people rushed towards the winner, trying to take their prize by force. It didn't take long before the pleading began. The weaker players started begging for their lives. Finally, my claw landed correctly, and the metal prongs gripped the ball I needed, lifting it aloft and dropping it down the chute. I snatched the sphere with the key and bolted for the door. Other players noticed and began to chase after me. I dodged through the crowd, weaving through machines, prying open the plastic eggs as I went. I reached the exit with desperate bodies close behind me. I slammed the key home and leapt through the door. (sighs) 
I tried to calm my breathing. I registered the other players who had made it out of the arcade. Two women and two men. The new room was large and empty with a single exit at the far end. Behind me, hands and fists pounded on the door I'd come through, and alarmed voices filtered through the metal. Slowly, I felt the door get warm, then too hot to lean against, and then the voices turned to screams. Smoke crept under the other closed doors, and the sickly sweet smell of burning flesh began to dance in my nose. The others in the room backed away, eyes wide. The far door opened. As we stepped through to our next event, we were greeted by five long ropes stretching across a seemingly bottomless pit. At the spot where the rope anchored at our side of the gap was a closed colored box. The colors matched a surviving person's jumpsuit. Red, blue, green, yellow, white. Our instincts kicked in and we rushed to our corresponding boxes. Lifting the lid, I discovered a harness, carabiner, and trolley. I almost laughed in relief. I'd used these cleaning windows and knew how to use them. I quickly stepped into the harness, cinching the straps, and attached the carabiner. Stepping to the edge of the pit, I set the trolley on the rope and clipped myself to it. As I leaned out over the yawning gulf, I felt my pulse ramp up once more. I began to pull myself over the drop as fast as I could. The other contestants were not far behind. One of the female players noticed my lead and started pulling too fast. Her trolley slipped. The carabiner snapped open, and she fell screaming to her death. The man in the green jumpsuit lost his hand strength halfway across and fell. I paced myself and was the first to make it to the opposite side. I released my harness from the rope and dashed into the next room. A man in yellow overalls ran in right behind me. The exit slammed shut, and once again, heat, screams, and the smell of smoke spilled under the door. My opponent in the yellow coveralls turned to me, a bald man with a thick black beard. How'd you get here? An elevator and bad luck. I was about to ask you the same questions. The bearded man shook his head. No, to the tower, idiot. All I know is one minute I was working with some movers, helping an old lady get situated in her new apartment. The next, I'm playing twisted games with my life as the prize. Movers? So, they finally opened this shithole to the rich pricks? I guess. You weren't part of the moving crew for today? I was living in an alley behind Tower 107. A man approached me and asked if I wanted a better life. To live in a tower instead of in the alley of one. 
I got nothing to lose, so I said yes. Looks like if we don't go along, we're both fucked. Yeah? I nodded. The bearded man laughed and slapped my back hard, almost causing me to fall over. Congratulations to the final two! The voice boomed louder than ever. Or maybe it was because there were now fewer bodies to absorb the sound. Good luck out there. You'll need it to make it through the mirror maze. Remember, there can be only one winner. I'd wish you luck, but that means I'd be dead. So fuck off and hope you die. (laughs) Same to you. We rushed into the new rooms and found ourselves in front of two colored mazes. A blue one for me, and a yellow one for my bearded rival. With a nod to my opponent, I dashed into my labyrinth. The mirrored surfaces and glass walls reminded me of a twisted carnival funhouse. Some of the mirrors were only glass, allowing me to see the bearded man in his maze. He looked angry. He wanted to win, to live. I couldn't blame him. So did I. We'd been forced into this. All we could do was try and survive. I ran through the maze as best I could, ignoring the man on the other side who wanted me dead. I crashed into mirror after mirror, wall after wall. My heart reached a frantic staccato as I slammed into walls and pinioned around corners. I I couldn't find a way out. Each way I turned was just another mirror. I pulled to a halt at the dead end, met by multiple reflections of my gasping, sweaty face. Damn it. No, something was different. I felt a whisper of air on the back of my neck. I turned and studied the entrance to the cul-de-sac and saw a dark gap between the mirrors. The space was just large enough for a body to pass through. Stepping to the wall, I looked through the opening. A shadowy tunnel greeted me. I squeezed into the blackness and resumed running, reinvigorated. I could hear the bearded man calling out to me, pleading for me to help him, not to leave him to die. I made it to the end of the tunnel and found myself in a small lit room with no doors. The only exit was a ladder reaching upward. It stretched impossibly high, its braces old and rusted, with no other options. I began to climb. Surprisingly, the bearded man's voice grew nearer the higher I rose. The desperation in the shouts had been replaced by glee. I was ten feet from the top of the ladder when his grinning face appeared above me. You need to climb faster than that, pal. Seems I'm not the one dying today. He grabbed the top of the ladder and shook it. My aching fingers grasped weakly as the ladder began to wobble, twist and turn, its old braces snapping loose. I pleaded and begged for him to let me up. We didn't have to be victims of these rich bastards' blood sport. My opponent paused his pushing to look down at me. His smile faded for a moment. Then, with the final heave, he threw the ladder back free of its moorings, and me with it. My hands slipped from the rungs and I was falling hard and fast. As my body tensed in anticipation of impact, I heard a loud whooshing sound accompanied by intense light and heat. I don't know if I ever hit the ground. My body burned long before I finished my final descent. The Tower Written by Kyle Wilcox Featuring performances by David O'Steele As Mike Margaret Ashley As the Old Woman Jesse Holt as Beard, Aaron King as the Secretary, and Jason Wilson as the Announcer. Engines of War, written by Michael Zanke. 
featuring performances by LaQuinn Groves as Admiral Beckett, Graham Rowan as Bob, Alastair Mackey as Todd, Margaret Ashley as the architect, Sarah Ruth Thomas as Samantha Winters, Mark Whitten as Moth, and Joe Stofko as Belial. Musical composition was by J.M. Scherf. Episode artwork, web development, and creative direction by Cassie Pertit. Social media and Patreon management by Brooks Bigley. Videography is by Hale Scherf. Audio engineering and sound design is by me, Jason Wilson. Bet that's the last time anyone helps an old lady move into a new place, huh? I tell you what, if any of you rich people in your death games want to make a donation to the Grey Room, hit me up anytime. I'll cut you a great price. Speaking of great prices, have you signed up for one of our new Patreon tiers yet? Get extra access to one-of-a-kind merch and a peek into the inner sanctum to see if Bob is a boxer's or briefs kind of demon. And we would like to take this time to thank our patrons and any of those who have left us a five-star rating and a review. Those reviews keep us at the top of the charts and makes it easier for more twisted souls to find the show. Patrons like Bridget Criswell, Ellen Houghton, Eric Pritchard, Eric Phones, Jackal Bot Snows, Lynn Browning, Matthew Smith Deal, Patrick Stewart, Ronan Kumori, Sean Gary, Pepsi Man, Lachlan Watt, Joshua Kovac, and Hypnotic Spectre. You can find the Grey Rooms on Spotify, iTunes, or your favorite podcatcher. But we're also now available on iHeartRadio's Spreaker app. Download the iHeartRadio Spreaker app, or just open your browser and search the Grey Rooms. Now, we here at the Grey Rooms love our fans and want to give back to you in the best way that we know how. We have a lot of fun things to show you, and we do hope that you like them. You can find out more by joining us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, YouTube, Reddit, Twitter, and Facebook. And we took your advice and extended an olive branch to all of the tortured souls who have passed through the rooms. Our emotional support group is always looking to help you with all of your needs. And do not forget about our merch store. It is full of epic designs and logos for you to sport, showing the world that you are a survivor of these very rooms. All of this can be found in the show notes or on our website at thegrayrooms.com. And have you checked out our Discord server? If you only listen to the podcast, you're only getting half the experience. Join for free to hang out with Grey Rooms cast and crew. Watch movies, listen to music, or learn to write your very own horror story. Now, our community grows daily, and you can meet and interact with like-minded fans from all over the world. And a fresh scent can always be found in our board of directors bathroom. Mm -mm -mm. Well, episode 14, in the books. Now we have just a handful left before we conclude season four and begin preparations for season five. So we do hope that you're enjoying this so far. We have a lot more ahead of us still, so we're gonna get our hands deep in the mud and get back to work. So till next time, thanks for your support, and we'll see you next week. Copyright 2022-2023. All rights reserved.